Hi guys, it's Mark Zickery, Mr. Sci-Fi, also known as Mark Zickery of Space Command. And today I'm going to be talking about three great dystopic novels, the great dystopic novels of the mid-20th century. And uh, if you haven't read these, I highly recommend them. They're also available on audio, of course, so you can... Um, check that out. Now, we will be returning very soon to our history of science fiction. We'll be talking about the 40s and the 50s, then into the 60s, 70s, etc. And I'll be also doing an update about Space Command very soon. If you want to buy Space Command shares, they're still available, 7,500 bucks. We're ramping up to shoot a lot more. We're pitching the show. We're doing all sorts of stuff. It's I'm spending day after day after day with the erstwhile Dave Edison, who uh, is our wonderful editor, and we're getting things really to look terrific. So uh, there's a lot, a lot ahead, and I'll be telling you about that very soon. Um, and of course, subscribe to Mr. Sci-Fi, click the little bell below so you'll be notified when we have new uh, videos like this one. But so let's just jump into this because there were um, three novels that really changed the uh, direction of science fiction and had a huge, huge, huge influence on everything that came after them. And um, the first was this, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. It was written in 1932. This is the American first edition. And I've mentioned before that I love old books because they have a history to them in the individual copy. And if you look here, you can see an inscription. And the inscription is from 1932. And it basically says, The Tempest, Act 5, Scene 1. Miranda, O oh wonder, how many godly creatures are there here? How beauteous mankind is, O oh, brave new world that has such people in it. Which, of course, is a quote from Shakespeare's The Tempest. And then it says, for the, convales for, the convalescent, for the convalescent dish, light food, light reading. And then it's signed, Madaka. So there's, so there's a, just you know, so someone was clearly convalescing, and someone bought them this book and gave it to them as a present. And here's the title page, you can see, 1932. And this is a science fiction novel written by Aldous Huxley. Now, now previously, I mentioned... T.H. Huxley, who was one of H.G. Wells' professors, and he was a very, very well-known scientist of the time and, and um, teacher, and he was very much a, an adherent to the new theory of Darwinism and uh, natural selection, etc., and the uh, and T.H. Huxley was the grandfather of Aldous Huxley, who was one of the leading British writers of the um, 20th century. And later he would write something called The Doors of Perception that was about um, hallucinogenic drugs, which he had taken and was writing about that whole experience. But during, And he ultimately moved to California, and so he was very much an expatriate. But when he wrote Brave New World, that was before all that. And this, is a, this takes place in the future. And... Uh, Basically, the cover says, a witty and wickedly satirical novel about the impending Model T utopia that does fantastic things to such old-fashioned ideas as motherhood, death, fear, love, and happiness. <clears throat> and essentially, it takes place in a future where uh, standard religions have been uh, supplanted by a, a religion of uh, Henry Ford, is basically uh, the, the, the top dog, and... Uh, uh, and people are born in test tubes. There's no mothers or fathers. Biological mothers and fathers are considered obscene and are not discussed. Um, and there's a drug called Soma that you take to feel calm and happy about everything. It's a wonderful book, and uh, and it really, um, uh, it's just really um, uh, prophetic and interesting, and it influenced a lot of science fiction to come. If you look at a, an episode like Twilight Zone's uh, Number 12 Looks Just Like You, you can really get a lot of feeling about it from Brave New World. So if you haven't read it, I recommend it. There's a version of it you can get on Audible or via your local library, an audio version that's read by Michael York, who starred in Logan's Run. So uh, very, very cool. And again, when I mentioned that Aldous Huxley was the grandson of T.H. Huxley, who was the mentor and and teacher of H.G. Wells, you start to see how all of this ripples. And when, when Huxley wrote this, Wells was alive, and he was very uh, frequently giving talks on the BBC. He was writing book after book after book. And so uh, Huxley was obviously reading Wells. Wells was very, um, uh, you know, in, in, in books like The Time Machine and Island Road, Doc, Dr. Moreau, you had a sense of his um, pessimism or concern about the future. And uh, so, well, so Huxley was the first of the great three. And then uh, in 1948, this came out. And this is, again, another edition from when it came out, 1984, by George Orwell. And this is published by the American publisher Harcourt Brace in New York. So it's the American first. And 
1948. And so George Orwell was a, a writer and a commentator of the um, passing parade. And, and, H, and 1984 has come back into vogue because of all, everything going on in Europe and America, the political scene, and the threat of totalitarianism around the world. And this is the great cautionary tale of totalitarianism. It's been made into a film. Uh, Brave New World was made into a um, miniseries in t uh, a few decades ago, but it wasn't very good. In fact, it's very funny because one of the things that uh, Huxley has in his book is that at birth, people are divided up into different classes um, that do different tasks. So the, the ruling class, the intellectual class are the alphas, then there's the betas, the deltas, etc. And the lower classes, the deltas, the gammas, are uh, the working class. And they're uh, programmed essentially to uh, avoid books, hate books, hate flowers. You know, they're the workers. And uh, so in the, uh, in the TV show, Bud Court from Harold and Maude played um, uh, a character who was an alpha plus, a gen super genius, and uh, the reviewer said he looked more like an alfalfa alpha plus, which was a reference to the alfalfa alpha in the R gang comedies. So uh, really, really fun, really fun. And uh, but um, but 1984 has been made in in, in versions in, in film, in television, in radio. So there's a great radio version with Richard Widmark. There's a BBC TV version from the 50s with. Um, um, the actors from that that period, uh, including ones you'll recognize in Star Wars later on. There's also a, a great version with John Hurt that was sp supposed to come out in 1984, but actually came out in 1985 with Richard Burton in it as well. It's a very good version. But but 1984 is an extremely dark uh, novel and very bleak, and it deals with a character named Winston Smith who works at the Ministry of Propaganda. Essentially, uh, the world is divided into three areas and uh, he's in the British area that covers Europe and um, and the fascinating thing about that is he's first of all he's writing about the British totalitarian, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Russians, the Soviet Union, USSR, their totalitarianism with bugging people and so forth. So he has televisions that you watch and they watch you as you watch them. Now of course recently it came out that, that the modern televisions can actually do that and there was a bit of a scandal about that and uh, and the whole notion of the loss of privacy. And originally he didn't want the book called 1984, he wanted it called 1948, which was the year it came out because he felt he was writing about the present and extrapolating where it might lead. But the publisher said, no, 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 no. This is a science fiction novel. It will be published, you know, as 1984. And, and 1984 became the catchphrase for anything relating to loss of personal freedom. So, uh, so even though we're well past the actual year of 1984 now, uh, it still is the phrase that's used when something is uh, taking our liberties away. And um, that's a very, it's a terrific book. All three books I'm going to talk about are terrific, and I highly recommend you read them. But Orwell's is the darkest, and it's about a man who falls in love with uh, a, a woman in his totalitarian state, and they have to be clandestine about their romance, and it's about what happens from there. And, uh, and he predicts a lot of things that have come to pass, uh, and uh, both socially and, and technologically. And, um, and also, but the interesting thing is that, that people think, well, he's just talking about the Soviet Union, but that's not actually true, because during World War II, Orwell was employed in the Ministry of Pro Propaganda in England during World War II to, uh, to make sure that the propaganda was pro-British, pro-Allies, and, uh, and he was working in this vast white pyramid <clears throat> building. And so he then extrapolated that for the three buildings that are the different main ministries of um, you know, ministry propaganda, etc., in 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 the world of 1984. So there's much more that's actually what Orwell was doing and the building he was working in. It's it's not imaginary. It's him extrapolating from what he was actually doing during World War II and the and the fact that you would erase the history, you would erase the truth, and that and that what you said was truth would be accepted as true. And that and there was something called thought crime, where if you're thinking something that goes against the state, that's a crime too. And the idea was that they were taking words out of the language, so there wouldn't even be the concepts anymore. And so when you look at how you, language is utilized now and how thing and and the issue of what is truth. Uh, this is very, very much in 1984 and very, um, very prescient in that way. So it's, it's a terrific book, uh, but definitely uh, be ready for something that's depressing. But, um, <clears throat> you know, and um, but then we move on to the third great book, the third great dystopic novel of the 20th century, mid 20th century, and that is Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. And this, again, is the first edition of that. It's signed to me by Ray, who was a great friend and mentor. Now, interestingly enough, 
Um, Ray once wrote that um, that this was not a de um, he's, he, that he wasn't a pessimist that he was an optimist and this is an optimistic novel and he's right because all three books are about the relation of the state the relationship of the state to the um, individual and whether the individual will be crushed by the state by the totalitarian state or by the state that rules every aspect of the individual's life <clears throat> and in Fahrenheit 451 Montag is a fireman but in the future firemen burn books and books are forbidden and then he starts reading books and he discovers the wonders that are in them and, and his his life is completely turned around and it's uh, it's a great book I, 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 I love it it's um, the shortest of the three and uh, it was made into a very good film uh, by Francois Truffaut in the 60s, starring Oscar Werner and Julie Christie. I recommend that film very much. It has a terrific score by Bernard Herrmann. Ray loved that version. There was a more recent version on HBO that I don't like and would not recommend. It, it sort of missed the point of the book. But um, but the book itself is, is quite wonderful. And it has um, and, and there's actually an audible version that I would also recommend of Ray Bradbury reading the book. And uh, and that's really quite quite a delight to actually hear the author reading his own work. And um, and this came out in 1953, and Ray wrote the book. He wrote various versions of it. He wrote it first as sort of a novella that appeared in um, uh, Galaxy Magazine. I've got a copy of it somewhere in here. Oh, here it is. This is the first publication of Fahrenheit 451 in a form. It was called The Fireman. So you can see the title there. This is also signed to me by Ray. And, uh, and he wrote it as The Fireman. And then he wrote it in a longer version for Playboy magazine, so it was serialized in the first three issues of Playboy, and then it was published as a novel. Now, the interesting thing about this, one of the interesting things about it is, first of all, Ray, um, at that time, he had had his young daughters. I think he had three of them at that point, and, uh, uh, and it was impossible to write at home with all the you know kerfuffle. And so he went to UCLA to the research library, and downstairs, you could rent typewriters. I think it was a dime per hour. And so he basically... Uh, wrote the entire book in a matter of something like seven days, uh, and uh, and spent you know sixty bucks in dimes or whatever, and uh, and just poured the book out. And uh, he'd been thinking about this issue for a long time. He'd written stories about totalitarianism, such as The Pedestrian. And uh, there's actually a book called a, Pl a Pleasure to Burn, which collects all the short stories that Ray wrote and the pieces that Ray wrote that kind of led up to Fahrenheit 451. And um, but uh, and it's got a great illustration, great cover by Joe Mignani, Ray's great illustrator, and uh, the the cover of the first edition paperback is very beautiful, also by Mignani. And uh, but there's an interesting, interesting history of that book, which is that Ray had written um, Illustrated Man and Martian Chronicles that came out uh, before Fahrenheit 451, and he was under contract to that publisher to pub to provide his third book to them, his third novel, and uh, but. But um, Ballantine Books, the great Ballantine's Books, was planning a new experiment where they would publish the paperback and the hardcover at the same time. And Ray very much wanted to explore that possibility because the way it worked back then was the hardcover would come out first to get the reviews, but that wouldn't generate most of the revenue for the writer. And then you might wait a year before the paperback came out, and that would sell more copies and bring the author more money. Whereas by publishing simultaneously a hardcover and a paperback edition, you'd get the reviews and the revenue. And so Ray wanted to try that, but he was under contract to, uh, to the other publisher to provide them his, third, his, his next novel. So what he did to um, avoid that was that the first edition of, of Fahrenheit 451 has this along with two novellas, and it's basically a collection printed as a collection of stories. Now, you only get that in the first edition, but that was how he kind of sidestepped that. And um, uh, and and ultimately, the, the experiment with Ballantine didn't work out. They published another, a number of books, uh, both as paperbacks and hardcovers simultaneously, but it didn't really ultimately um, pan out as they had hoped. But Fahrenheit 451 came out. It was a big critical and financial success. It was in print throughout Ray's entire life, and now it's in the curriculum of many high school classes. Wonderful book to read, and again, as I say, you can read it either as a uh, as a, an audio book, a physical book, ebook, whatever, and uh, you'll you'll get great great value from it. It's very um, uplifting. The changes that were made in the movie. Ray actually felt that there was one change where one character appears at the end of the movie that we meet at the beginning that he wishes he had not had thought of when he wrote the book, but he didn't go back and change it even though he approved of that alteration. Uh, additionally, Ray later wrote a play 
um, which expands upon some of the themes in the book. And the play is, is fun, and it's, it's worth seeing or, or, or reading, and, um, and I can recommend that as well. But these, are, and, but these books had a huge ripple effect, and if you look at a movie like Brazil, Brazil is essentially 1984 done in Terry Gilliam's style. And, um, and you'll see, you'll see any, any dystopic fiction that came after the, these three, three books was influenced by one or more of them. And, and, uh, so, and they still are every bit as relevant, uh, Brave New World is every bit as relevant with the drug culture, avoiding uh, feelings, uh, looking toward our artificiality um, instead of gen genuine experience. Very, very uh, predictive of that. 1984 is the great book on totalitarianism and 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 um, and re rewriting the history, rewriting the present, changing the narrative. And again, uh, Orwell was influenced by the the Nazis, by what happened during propaganda in England, what happened with the Soviet Union. And then Fahrenheit 451. Ray, of course, was reading Brave New World. Was reading 1984. He was very conversant with the literature of the time. The interesting thing, by the way, is that. 1984 and Brave New World were not marketed as science fiction, and they were marketed basically as mainstream literature, and neither Orwell nor um, Aldous Huxley considered themselves uh, science fiction writers. But um, Ray's book was, it eventually broke out, Ray worked very hard to break out of the, what was called the science fiction ghetto to, the, to mainstream, and he was in transition around this period. So Don Congdon, his agent, was helping him break out to the better paying magazines like Saturday Evening Post, Playboy, was a very, very good paying uh, fiction market, and, um, and it was happening with his books as well. So he was, he, he always kind of stayed in the science fiction fold, but he was also in the mainstream as well. And, uh, and that, that served him very well, financially particularly. But, um, but these are three great books. They haven't, um, they've aged very well. They, they don't seem musty at all. And, um, and I think if you haven't read them, you should. And if you read them some time ago, check them out again because they're really well worth it. So, um, so that's about it for now. Um, we'll get back to the history of science fiction. We'll update you on Space Command very soon. Uh, if you want to buy a share in Space Command, then, uh, call me at 323-363-1259 or email me at markzickery at gmail.com. And, um, and make sure you subscribe to Mr. Sci-Fi. You, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter, and there's a Space Command page on Facebook as well. <clears throat> We're moving forward. So um, that's about it for now, and thanks very much, and we'll talk again really soon. Bye, guys.